This is one of the most terrible pages in the entire history of the world, which has become a symbol of unprecedented cruelty and caused the lives of a million people who were killed and tortured in just a hundred days. During the genocide, about 10,000 people died daily. Caste division in Rwanda Historically, two, so to speak, castes lived in Rwanda, the Hutu and the Tutsi. The Tutsis were farmers, while the Hutu were pastoralists. There were no fundamental differences between the two types of occupation. A farmer could become a cattleman and vice versa. Later, the Hutu became the so-called priests, and the Tutsi became warriors. This continued until the middle of the 19th century, when a centralized state began to form in Rwanda. Historically, the royal dynasty was Tutsi, so over the time it was this caste that began to enjoy certain privileges. But this applied only to the highest layer of government. There were no special divisions below, nor was there any special dominance of the Tutsis. Everything changed dramatically after the end of the Second World War, when the former colonies began to gain independence thanks to the widespread ideas of national liberation. After that, the Hutus began to think that their low social status in the state was unfair. Belgium also added fuel to the fire, maintaining close ties with Rwanda. According to Albert Kamachin, the Belgian policy was the cause of the conflict. Belgium involved only Tutsis in governing the country. This led to a gradual belief in Hutu consciousness that the Tutsis were oppressors and enemies. In addition, the fact that both Hutu and Tutsi were divided between Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zaire, added to the problem. Due to this support, in 1959 the social revolution took place in Rwanda a Hutu uprising against the Tutsis. As a result of the revolution, power passed to the Hutus for three years. Three years later, in 1962, Rwanda declared independence, and the new leaders, Hutu, changed policy radically, belittling the Tutsi minority. The leader of the country, juvenile Habi Yaramana, was especially inclined towards such discrimination. It should be noted here that the main source of income in the country was the export of coffee so world prices for it greatly influenced the economic situation. And in the late 80s, when world coffee prices collapsed as a result of crisis, the situation in Rwanda began to deteriorate rapidly. The government did not have the resources to actually buy off the local population, which was rapidly becoming poor. Moreover, there was a squabble for resources at the very top of the government. Beginning of the genocide Perhaps the Tutsi themselves took the first step in order to start the genocide. Many of them served in the army of neighboring Uganda, creating the so-called Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF. And at the end of September 1990, about 4,000 Tutsi soldiers seizing weapons deserted from the Ugandan army and attacked Rwanda. For the ruling regime of juvenile Habi Yaramama, the attack itself became a serious threat as it could lead to an overthrow. Belgium, Zaire, and France immediately intervened in the situation. But for Habi Yaramama, that was a real gift. As all experts on Africa have unanimously stated, the RPF invasion turned out to be a good send for Habi Yaramama regime. It allowed him to strengthen his position by playing the ethnic card. Almost immediately he launched a campaign against the Tutsi. From that moment, a civil war began between the Houthis and the Tutsi armed groups. Perhaps it would have ended with time, but a tragic accident occurred which served at the beginning for the massacres. On April 6, 1994, a plane carrying President Juvenal Habir Mana and the President of Burundi exploded in Kigali, the capital of Rwanda. The plane, according to the official version, was shot down. This was confirmed by the command post dispatcher. I looked to where the presidential plane was flying from and saw flames in front of it. I immediately called the pilot, but he did not answer. My assistant told me that he saw the flight of three fiery projectiles. The first passed under the plane, the second over it, and the third struck it. It was not possibly established who exactly committed the attack, and the authorities were not going to find it out anyway. On the contrary, the elite blamed the Tutsis for the tragedy, and already in the evening of the same day a massacre began in Kigali. Armed with clubs, machetes, and knives, the Hutus destroyed all the Tutsis who caught their eye broke into houses, killing everyone from children to very old people. At the same time, the offensive of the armed formation of the Tutsi began, 
which on April 11 almost approached the capital. Therefore, the only way for the elite to maintain power was to unite all Houthis against the Tutsis. It should be noted here that the majority of the population was illiterate, so the only source of the information was the government's Seven Hill Radio. When the Houthis united across the country against their alleged enemy, a massive campaign of total extermination of all Tutsis began. The authorities called not only for killing, but also for looting and rape. In fact, the Tutsis were declared non-humans, with whom Houthis could do whatever they wanted. Outwardly, they were determined by their higher growth and similar to European facial features. The folk way was simpler. If you could stick two fingers in your nostrils without any problems, you were a Hutu. If not, a Tutsi. And here we still need to take into account national characteristics in Rwanda. Historically, there were two types of relationships, submission to the authorities of violence. Violence was seen as normal way to solve problems, and obedience to authority helped to remove any responsibility. In fact, the Hutus left their home for a murder as if it were something very common. According to the psychology of Hutu peasants, the killing of Tutsis was no different, for example, from killing a rat or other pests, murdering them with absolutely no emotion. Moreover, those Hutus who did not personally take part in the executions did not even try to stop their fellow tribesmen. Genocide Thanks to the radio, which openly announced the list of those who were guilty, subject to destruction and posed a threat to the country, the Hutus simply identified the guilty and destroyed them. Refugees were shot at the roadblocks, beaten to death with clubs and hoes. And again, the Hutus did not see anything shameful in this. For the sake of fairness, it must be said that many Hutus not only did not take part in the mass executions, but hid Tutsis, some secretly, other openly. Therefore, rather quickly, the radio began to announce the list of Hutu which were also subject of immediate execution. On average, about 10,000 people were killed every day across the country, and radio continued broadcasting stories about the Tutsis who hated the Hutu. Gina is not doing any good at this call. She had a husband named Gaston, a Tutsi who fled the Burundi. He left, but one day he returned from there and began to harm the Hutus in his commune. He arranged their murders using this woman, Gina, who is his wife. It is quite natural that Gina's fate was decided. The authorities, kindling an insane fire, actively promoted the idea that the Tutsis are subhuman that they pose a danger to the Hutus, and so on. In fact, on the threshold of the 21st century, an ugly manifestation of the ideology of Nazism appeared. The Tutsis, of course, tried to both defend themselves and organize armed resistance, but they did not achieve much success. We repeat that not only Tutsis were destroyed, but also oppositional and even moderate Hutu who were supporters of the policy of national reconciliation and of the massacre. Only after the Tutsi militias occupied the capital on July 17, the massacre stopped. As a result, in a hundred days, according to various sources, from half a million to a million both Hutus and Tutsis were killed. At least a quarter of a million women were raped, and state infrastructure was almost completely destroyed. Financial institutions, houses, museums, and so on were also looted. The scale of the tragedy is estimated by historians to this day. The new government of Rwanda, in order to prevent this, has adopted a number of programs and measures that should change the situation in the country radically. In Rwanda, special camps are organized where everyone is trained. They are told about the absence of difference between Tutsi and Hutu. Mass educational campaigns are also continuously held throughout the country. Moreover, at the state level, it is forbidden to indicate in any documents who a citizen is, a Hutu or a Tutsi. Simply mentioning a person's belonging to one of the castes is prosecuted in the country by law, and the responsibility for this is not even administrative but criminal. Another consequence of that tragedy was that the locals would never talk to anyone about the events of 1994, and if someone insists, they may have serious problems with the police.